When God gave Moses these Ten Commandments, he gave them at a time when he was exodusing them out, taking them out of the land of Egypt, the land of slavery, and into the promised land. Halfway along that journey, he says, Moses, time out. I need to actually give you some new rules to live by, um, some new mindsets to uh, be mindful of, because this is God's blueprint for blessing. This is God's roadmap to riches. Because when you live in a slave land too long, who knows, God can get you out of Egypt, but then he has to get Egypt out of, out of you. And so Exodus 20, Exodus 20 is where we find these Ten Commandments. And it's interesting, if you haven't seen it, this is how it starts. Then God spoke all these words. He, first of all, here's what he said. He said, I am the Lord your God. That speaks of relationship. This is not just a set of rules and regulations that we've grown up thinking God's trying to restrict us. No, no, no. They're more like recommendations for a healthy relationship for God to bless us. When you see the shift, it changes how you see these Ten Commandments. He wants a relationship because I'm the God who brought you out of the what? Out of the what? Out of the land of Egypt and also out of the the house of bondage. Why does God take, have to take us out of the land? Because when you've been in a slave land for so long, you don't plant seeds in a slave land because you know whatever you plant, they're going to steal, they're going to rob from you. And who knows, if you don't plant seeds, you'll never see a, a harvest. So God has to take them out of the land and take them into a promised land where every place that they put their feet, God says, I'm going to give you as an inheritance. Because if you don't plant seeds, you won't see a... So he has to take them out of the land, but then he has to take the land out of them. And he says, I need to also take you out of the house of bondage, the house of slavery. Who knows that every house has certain rules? Who knows you can't just eat at everyone's house? <laughs> you can't just eat at... Every house has a set of rules. I, I want to call them mindsets and methodologies. These mindsets and these methodologies will keep you stuck, will keep you starving, will keep you in bondage, will keep you in suffering. If you don't learn to get that stuff out of your mind, when you get into the promised land, you're going to repeat the patterns of the past. And so this is why God's saying, I've got to get you out of that land. And then he gives them a list of things that if you follow these, these will bless you. Amen. These will bless you. It's amazing how the Bible says that when we look at God's Word, it's like looking in a mirror in James. So the mirror's here because we're looking into God's Word. Oh, you're looking good today, T-boy. Come on, baby. Yes, Lord. I mean, you didn't tell me. Well, I'll tell myself. When we look into the mirror of God's Word, we get to see how we're measuring up. But sometimes you've got to go, oh, got something there, got to think. Who knows that when we measure up against the Ten Commandments, if we're going to be honest, who would say there are areas that we fall short and we miss it? All of us should have our hands up, because if you don't have your hands up, you suffer from lying. <laughs> when we look into a mirror, we see where we fall short. But are you grateful for the New Testament? Because, because when we go through the New Testament and we come looking at the mirror in Jesus, who knows that the Bible says that Jesus hung on the cross and he paid the price that you and I should have paid. So when we look in the mirror, we're no longer seeing ourselves. We're seeing Jesus who paid the price for us. And what did Jesus do? He hung on a cross and his body was broken and his blood was shed so that we could be free and right with God. This is the good news, because now, when we look in the mirror through Jesus Christ, someone say, through Jesus, here's how we see ourselves. We see ourselves like Jesus. And what did Jesus do on the cross? The Bible says in Isaiah that he was pierced for our transgressions. Our mistakes, he took the, pr the price for. He was crushed for our iniquities. What happened when Jesus was pierced in the side with the spear? What came out of him? blood and water. The mirror of the word, the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament can't cleanse you. The mirror can't cleanse you, only water can cleanse you. And that's why when Jesus hung on the cross, it was water that came out of his side to cleanse us, but it was also his blood that came out to cover us. 
In the Old Testament, you can clap your hands because that's a good word. In the Old Testament, when the blood of the Lamb went over the door and the angel of death came to set God's people free, wherever there was blood, they were covered and they were protected. Come on, anyone thankful that we're not just cleansed by the blood of Jesus for the sins that we have done, but we're covered by the blood of Jesus for every mistake that we would ever make. That means you are right with God. So here's how I want you to see it. The Old Testament is no longer what must be done. The Old Testament is what has been done. Listen, this is not what we have to do to get to God. This is what Jesus has done so God can come to us. Jesus satisfies every single one of these Ten Commandments. Let's pop it on the screen right now. Take a picture and remember this. The Ten Commandments is not just something to be done. Go back to it. It's something that has been done. Amen. Clap your hands if you believe that. I want to show you in the New Testament how true this is, that it's a finished work that Jesus has done. So when we enter into Jesus, we can actually satisfy this. So there's grace for the gaps. Because we're going to make some mistakes. We're going to trip up. God is not trying to do this so you can get to heaven. God actually sent heaven to earth to restore the relationship. And through Jesus, he lifts us back up into that relationship. And we see this in 1 John, a lot of scripture today. So strap on your helmets because we're diving in. 1 John chapter 2 verse 3 says this, And we can be sure that we know him only if we obey his commandments. Verse 4 says, If someone says that I know God. Come on, who, who knows God in here? Wave your hands in the air like you just do care. All right? God wants to know you, but he says the only way that he knows you, he, that you know him, if you don't keep his commandments, God is saying that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. This is the New Testament. Next part of the verse. Verse 5 says, But those who obey God's word, God's word truly show how completely they love him. So is God saying that if we can obey these things, that we're showing how we love him? That's what he's saying here. That is how we know that we are living in him, in Jesus. Next verse. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. If you want the life style of Jesus, if you want the life of Jesus, you need to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. If you want the life of Jesus, you need to adopt the lifestyle. And the Bible says that Jesus came and he became the fulfillment of all of these. In fact, he breaks down all these 10 into two. And here are the two that he says. In Matthew 22, Matthew 22, they're asking him, Teacher, can you tell us what the greatest of the commandments in the law? Come on, who knows which one's the greatest? Some of you don't know because I saw our Instagram when you were asked... Um, what are the Ten Commandments? We're going to fix that in a minute. We're coming to that. But Matthew 22 said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? In verse 37, Jesus replied, First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your, your mind. That's the first one, the first leg, all right? All right, put your leg up, the first leg. The second leg that all these things walk on is this. He says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love your Self. In verse 40, here's what it says. All the law and all the prophets, all the Ten Commandments hang on what? These two commandments that Jesus said, which is what? Love the Lord your God, that's our vertical relationship. And love your neighbor as yourself, that's a horizontal relationship. And what do we see out of vertical and horizontal? Ooh, we see the cross, what Jesus has already done for you and me. So now when we look at the Ten Commandments, we see it like this. The first four commandments, I'll pop it on the screen, the first four commandments talk about our relationship with God. If you want to break down what does it mean to love God, he tells us, this is how you love me better. This is not about your salvation. This is about your strength. This is the road to riches. This is your highway. If you stay in this lane, you're going to go on the highway to health and happiness. So God is saying the first four, if you do that, you will walk in my love and the other six are about our horizontal relationships to improve our relationships with each other. So that's why through this whole series we're trying to find four things. What is the principle behind these commandments? Because it's not just rules and regulations to restrict you. 
It's actually recommendation for a relationship to bless you. So that's why we're pulling out the principle. We're talking about which person is it talking about. So last week, Pastor Emma preached about honor your mother and father. What was that relationship, vertical or horizontal? Horizontal. Relationship with your parents. Children, listen to that. <clears throat> last verse, one more verse to set this up. Jesus came and fulfilled all of these. And this is how we see in Matthew 5, 17. This is really important scripture. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I have a come to abolish the law. That's not why Jesus came. He said, I have come not to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. Because Jesus fulfilled them, when we're in Christ, we look in the mirror and see that I'm cleansed by the water and I'm washed and covered in the blood. Both of them. Next one. Under the blood, I'm under the blood. Jesus. Stop it. Verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the smallest stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from this law until everything has been accomplished. Next verse, verse 19. Therefore anyone who sets aside the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called what? the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands and what teaches and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The Old Testament is not just something we must do to get to God, but because of Jesus, this is now what God has done to get to us. He didn't lie. He didn't steal. He, all that stuff, Jesus fulfilled. Here's what I think God's trying to say through all of that. He's not trying to say stop trying in life because Jesus fulfilled it. He's just trying to say stop trying out because you're already on the team. Amen? Clap your hands if you're grateful that you're in Jesus' team. If, you're, if God is pleased with you because of Jesus Christ. So today I want to look at the um, <clears throat> third commandment. Third commandment found in Exodus 20 verse 7. Exodus 20 verse 7. And it says this. You shall not take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him or her guiltless who takes the name in vain. Today I want to tag a title to the text and I want to speak about not misusing God's name by calling this title, Watch Your Malt. Come on, add a bit of Jamaican flavor on there, turn to your neighbor and say, Watch Your Malt. Watch Your Mouth. If God was going to put a subtitle of this text, I think he would say it like this. Put some respect on my name. God would say to you, hey, when you use my name, put some respect on my name. Father, we thank you for your presence that's already here because we have worshipped you. God, help us to revere your name, to represent your name, God, to um, respect your name. May your presence come now. Give us power to step out of the old names we've been living under, which is um, abused or victim or powerless. And let's step under the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who is the name above names. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. And may we be able to stand as we stand in your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, if you love Jesus, clap your hands and shout, Amen. I am a little concerned about the biblical literacy of our church because we went around and asked some of you, do you know the Ten Commandments? And even our keyboard player, Yugito, said, yes, I know them. And he couldn't list one of them. I'm not calling you out, Yugito, or anyone else, but um, I'm here to help you. Come on, look at the person next to you say, he's here to help. He's here to help. He's here to help. If this is God's roadmap for riches, if this is his blueprint for blessings, who knows, if you don't know them, you can't obey them. So I'm going to help everybody here today to never forget the Ten Commandments. I'm going to say them in a way that you will enjoy it. Hey, we're filming right now. Instagram, TikTok, stop scrolling, listen to this. These are the Ten Commandments, and this is how you can understand them, because these are God's blueprint for blessing. You ready? Hold up one finger. This means God is number one. The first commandment is you should have no, come on, wiggle it, no other gods before me. I am number one. Hold up two fingers. Commandment number two is this. You shall make no graven images, no idols. So don't bow down. Come on, don't bow down to any other idols. I am number one. Hold up three fingers. What do you think the third commandment is? 
We're about to talk about it today. What does this, what letter does this look like? A W. Hey, God's saying, watch your words, watch your moat, watch your words, watch your walk. That means don't take the Lord's name in vain. Commandment number three. You ready for four? Four. Hold your whole four fingers up. What is your thumb doing? It's happening a little nap, having a little sleep. That means don't desecrate the Sabbath. Rest. Find yourself in the house of God. Don't work on the Sabbath. Rest and keep the Sabbath day holy. Hold up five fingers. Hold up five fingers. Come on, look really closely, all the fingers together. Are there two fingers that are taller than the other? You know who those tall fingers are? That's mum and dad. Mum and dad right now. Hold these two fingers together. That's mum and dad. And God is saying to you, children, honor your mother and your father. Is this helpful? All right, six. You know what six is? Thou shalt not kill. Pew! Pew, pew. Don't stab anybody with a sword and don't shoot them with a gun because we're in America, baby. America, baby. Number six, thou shalt not kill. What do you think number seven is? Number seven is this. These two people are married and they can lie down in the bed and have married people fun. Oh, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh. <laughs> That's married people fun. That, that, the, the seventh commandment is thou shalt not commit adultery. These two are married. These five have no place in their marriage. That means no pornography, no extra partners. Come on, do, don't commit adultery. Amen? Amen? What is number eight? Number eight. Let's put four fingers on each on hand. This way you'll remember it. Four fingers. What happened to my thumbs? They're not just resting. They've been cut off. Because in certain countries, when you steal, they'll cut off your thumbs. Thou, you won't steal. Thou shalt not steal. Number nine. What's number nine? Commandment number nine is this. Thou shalt not give false testimony against your neighbor. Basically, five is not four. Don't lie. <laughs> Don't lie on people. All right? Put truth in there. Five is not four. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And the final one, number ten. Hold up ten fingers. Hopefully everyone has ten fingers in here. Praise the Lord. Hold up ten fingers. What do you think that is? Thou shalt not covet. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Come on, leave her alone. Don't covet anyone. These are the Ten Commandments. This is God's blueprint for blessing. This is not just what to do. This is what Jesus has done. Share it with a friend and may your life be ten times better. Clap your hands in this place. You won't forget that. Let me test you real quick. What's commandment number seven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You won't forget that one now, will you? Oh, married couple. Wee wee. Okay. <laughs> Exodus 20 verse 7 says this. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. That's what we're saying here today. Commandment number three. What does it look like? A W. Watch your words. Watch your walk. And watch your witness. Someone, someone say, watch your words. Watch your walk. And watch your witness. Number three. Don't take the Lord's name name in vain because God will not hold him guiltless. You know, many of us grow up thinking that God is saying, you know, don't use his name in vain. Like if you stub your toe when you're walking in the house at night when it's dark, don't say, oh my God. Actually, someone on our video was saying, oh my God, so many times. Don't do that. But I don't think he's actually just saying, don't use the Lord's name in vain like that. Like don't um, hurt yourself and say, Jesus Christos. Did he say it? Jesus Christo. I don't think he's talking about that because most people um, use the Lord's name in vain when we're angry or we're frustrated. But actually, some people do it to show that they got some power. They curse you out. Now, listen, when people frustrate you, who knows there's some people you want to curse out in Jesus' name? Liars in this place. Come on. Who knows that sometimes, like, you, you're... Your boss gets on your last nerve, or, or your wife, or your husband, or your children. But can I ask you, has cursing anything out ever made it better? No. When you, cur when you curse something, you make it worse. Do you want your children to be cursed, or do you want them to be blessed? Stop cursing them out. Don't match their energy. And I think, clap your hands on that one. God is trying to show us that when we use his name in vain, when we curse things, we're not making them better. Nothing becomes, if you, your car won't start and you go, oh, Jesus Christ. You know, like, does that make your car start? <laughs> no, it doesn't. So stop cursing things out. The reason why I think God is actually saying what he's trying to say about his name is his name is his character. Write that down. You, God's name and your name is his character. In Proverbs 22, this scripture says, a good name, what type of name? A good name is more desirable than even great riches. 
A good name is held in high esteem and it's better than silver or gold. Most of you think you need money, but God's saying you just need a good name. You just need to come under the name of Jesus because there's authority, there's blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Your name is your character. And so God is saying when you use his name, don't use it frivolously. Don't use it without the power that's attached to it. Don't use his name that doesn't match his character. You know, I've seen some people get mad. I've seen this guy, girl broke up with him. He's like, God, just make her pay. Kill her. Kill her, Lord. She broke up and she broke my heart. Like, like seriously. Like if, let me get off that. Your, the name of God must be used consistently and also congruently with his character and with his will. When you pray in God's name, can I ask you, would anyone else be blessed except you? God is not just about you and selfishness. He is about you, but he's about the world. He's about your children. He's about your friends. He's about your family. Some people pray things that are not in God's name, but you've got to use his name that's consistent. Let's put it up on the screen. With his will, it's got to be consistent with his character. His name is his bond, and his name reveals his nature. If you want to know who God is, just check his name. And so the principle we're trying to teach you is to honor. The principle is we got to honor God's name and keep it honorable. So the commandment says, don't use the Lord's name in vain, because if you do, he will not hold you guiltless. Now let's define the word vain so we can get some clarity of what God is saying. All right. Vain means to, that something is empty. Like vain means to be empty of power, empty of truth, empty of character. Vain uh, means to be worthless. It means to reduce its worth and devalue it. Don't use God's word and his name falsely. Don't disrespect his name. Don't dishonor his name. And don't dilute his name by using it because his name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is... His name is life. So stop using the name of God to speak death over things. Stop using the name of God to curse things. The name is so important. And how do we honor his name? With our words, with our walk, and with our worship. With our words, with our walk, and also to be a witness in our worship. Go back to that scripture for a second. Proverbs 22. It says, a good name choose is, is better over great riches is the name of God. Names are so important. If I say the name Mother Teresa, what do you think of? Compassion. Love. If I say the name Judas, you think traitor in the Bible. If I say Solomon, you think what? Wisdom. Wise. If I say the name Hitler, what do you think? Murderer. Evil man. Come on, if I say baby oil, whose name do you think of? I'm sorry. Hey, the Bible doesn't hide the atrocities either. Let's be real. I'm not going to say his name, but here's my point. His name used to be synonymous with music mogul. Right now, his name might be synonymous with criminal. Once you lose your name, you lose your reputation. If your name gets diluted and defiled, you also get diluted and defiled. And that's what I'm trying to say. God says his name. Put some respect on his name. Don't he use his name emptily, without power, because his name is holy. His name is sacred. His name is higher than any other name. His name is higher than the cancer. His name is higher than the diabetes. His name is higher than the depression and the divorce. You are not damaged goods when you're a child of God. You are a Christian. Any Christians in here grateful that you carry the name Jesus? Jesus as the banner over your life. This is who Jesus is. Once you lose your name, you lose your power. You know, uh, Pastor Rick Blackwood preached here two years ago. Uh, an amazing pastor used to be down in Miami and uh, he's passed away now. But he told this story that when he was a young boy, 11 years old, he was playing out some baseball with some friends in a field near his house. As they were playing baseball, something happened, and he, he hurt some guy or did something wrong, and this older guy yelled at him, you know, you're nothing but a son of a... And fill in a beep, fill, female dog. His mother overheard what this older boy said to her son, Rick. And so when he went home for a little water break, his mother pulled him in and said, how could you let that boy say that to you and you say nothing to him? And Rick looked at his mom and said, mommy, I don't even know what he said. I don't know what that means. 
And so his mum went on to explain the birds and the bees and what that meant. She was a single mum raising two boys. And, he, and she told Rick that when that older boy said, you are this, he wasn't just talking about you, he was talking about me. And so she said, Ricky, you need to go out there and you need to fight him right now. Literally, his mum said to the 11 year old, you need to go and fight that boy. He couldn't understand why. And she said, Ricky, I am a single mom. I have worked hard for my integrity. I have worked hard for my name. I'm not going to let anyone just come here and blaspheme my name. When they attack my name, they're attacking me. And so Rick said he had to go out there and face up to the 15-year-old boy. And he's trying to fight this boy. And this boy is like thinking, what's this kid doing? So the older boy just slapped him. And so Rick falls to the ground and he thinks, do I get up? Do I not? He looks back at his mom and just shouts, yeah, and never say that about my mom again. <laughs> and so the story is the reason why the mom was so passionate about making sure that no one defamed her name because your name is your character. And once you lose your name, you lose your character and you lose your strength. And I want to tell you just like that, God is passionate about his name. God wants his name to be held in high esteem because once you dilute his name, you dilute the power of what he's able to do in and through your life. And God wants it. There's a reason why some of us are powerless because we haven't put power to his name. There is a reason why in areas of your life you feel impotent because you haven't allowed the potency of his name to take hold in your life. And we use his name frivolously without the power. But if we would understand the power that's attached to his name, I think some of your circumstances would change. If you understood the name, if you know he's got a great name, clap your hands and honor him and celebrate him in this place. Honestly, I've seen some of the most strong, powerful men be able to take abuse and cursing from people. But let someone cross that line and say something about their mother. Woo! You can say whatever you want about me, but don't, don't talk about my mother. You remember Will Smith, what he said? Take my wife's name out of your mouth. See, there's a line where we can take it for ourselves, but you come against our lady. You come against our woman. Let someone say something about your little baby. Mm. I couldn't even do that face Lakeisha did, but that was the stank face. <laughs> Let someone come at her baby. And here's what God says in Jeremiah 34. Jeremiah 34 says, But now you have turned around and you have profaned my name. How did they profane his name? Because God said, I need you to set the captives free. Don't use my name to put people in slavery because I'm a God of freedom. Don't profane his name. His name is his bond. And when you have come under the blood of Jesus... When the water that came from his side washed you clean, cleansed you, and covered you, he said, you better keep your end of the contract. When we first moved here from Australia, um, I wanted to buy a car. We were looking to buy a car for our family. We had enough money to buy one car with cash. It was only $7,000. Don't think we're rolling like that. All right? We bought it cash. The next car we needed, the family wagon. Oh, it's a bit embarrassing sometimes. The old mum minivan, soccer van. But praise God, who likes a minivan? No one. <laughs> Three people. We needed to buy a car, but because we came from Australia, we didn't have any credit here. So our credit rating was literally zero because we had no credit. So we had most of the money, but not all of the money. So one of my cousins said, you know what? I'm going to lend you my name. I'm going to lend you my credit. So we go in together. So although your credit's here, because I'm putting my name on it, it's going to lift your credit. Who knows that if I didn't keep my end of the bargain, it wouldn't have worked that way. I would have downgraded and defamed his name and pulled his name down. God is saying he's entrusted you with his name. He's given you the name that's above every other name. Please use it for what it's worth. Please uphold your end of the bargain because there's power attached to it. There's breakthrough attached to it. It is the blueprint for blessing on your life. Use his name. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's not common. It is uncommon. It's not unholy, it is holy. Use it for holy use. You'll find the power. So let's go back through the Bible in the Old Testament and see how God spoke about his name. Do you know in Exodus 6 it says that God never revealed his full name, not even to Abraham, not to Isaac, and not to Jacob. Now eyes on me for a second. Don't look at the scripture just yet. Watch this. Abraham was the father of faith. 
God did so much to Abraham, yet he didn't even know the name and the power that was attached to the name? I believe that God couldn't entrust them with knowing the... Fl- now, if I introduce myself and say, hey, I'm, I'm Kingston's dad. Hey, I'm Hosanna's dad. Like, do you know that's not my name? I'm revealing a part of my name. Or I'm Emma's husband. Or, hey, I'm pastor. I'm not telling you my name. I'm telling you attributes of my name. And just like that, God was revealing attributes of his name. Do you know next year we're actually going to do a whole series around the names of God. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Because many times we don't have it because we know that every name carries a narrative. And some of you have been living under that old name. Victim. Not smart. Ugly. Unqualified. I don't know what names you've been living on that people have spoken over your life, but God wants to break that off your life right now. Shatter that until you're not a victim. You are a victor in Jesus' name. You are not someone who has been abused, but you've been restored and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So in the Old Testament, we see all these different names for God, but it's only to Moses that God revealed his name. Before he gives him the Ten Commandments, he's speaking to Moses and says, Hey, Moses, you're in the wilderness. Go back and redeem and rescue my people from the promised land. And the Bible says that when he rescues them from the promised land, he says, God, I can't go and rescue them until you tell me. I need to be able to tell Pharaoh who's sending me. Like, what name and what authority am I going in? And he says, I'm going to reveal myself as what? Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh is such a powerful name. But to Abraham, he revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh. Do you know what Jehovah Jireh means? Okay, the inference is that he is your provider. But what the actual word means in its literal translation in Hebrew, it means God sees. So God tells Abraham, I need to go and test you and sacrifice your son to me. So he takes Abraham and he's going up to Mount Moriah. Little smart little Isaac is like, hang on, daddy, Abraham. I can see the wood you're carrying. But where's little Mary's little lamb to make the sacrifice to God? All right? And that's when Abraham says, God sees. God will see to it. You know, the literal word is not God will provide. He said, Jehovah, God sees. When God sees, that's called vision. Who knows that if you get a God vision, there'll always be provision. That's why I don't worry at the fact that we need to raise $4 million to get a building of our own with our own History Makers kids, an outreach center for single moms, a cafe for the community. $4 million is a lot of money that we don't have yet. But if it's a God vision, there will always be pro vision. Some of you are stressed and worried and staying up at night, but God, if God has spoken it, you will see it. If he has promised it, he will do it. Stand upon his word. If you don't see in your hands what God has said, keep trusting and keep believing. Because I know fully well that when God spoke to me in a 40-day fast, he said in Acts 7.34, retelling the story of Moses, he said, I have seen the oppression of my people and I've heard their prayers. And just like Moses was spoken to when the Israelites prayed, God spoke to Emma and I, When you prayed, when people here prayed to live a better story, God spoke to us to send us to unite his dream team, to unite his history makers, to unite his world changers, to make an epic and an eternal difference. If God said it, you're going to see it. If God said it, he will do it. Yahweh is the Hebrew word that means I bring into existence all that exists. And I love that when he said to Moses, "Tell tell, tell Pharaoh, Yahweh sent you. And Yahweh translated is I am. But he's like, I am who? Jehovah Jireh? Or are you Jehovah Nissi, my banner of victory? Are you Jehovah Shalom? My pe-? No, no, he said Yahweh. That means I am everything that you'll need for where you're about to go. And I came here this morning to tell you that your God is Yahweh. He is everything that you need for every situation. Do you need wisdom? Yahweh. Do you need strength? Yahweh. Do you need healing? Yahweh. Do you need forgiveness? Yahweh. It's not what has to be done. It's what has already been done in Jesus. And if you're in Christ, it's a finished work. You know what I love about the name Yahweh? That's actually not how you spell it. The, the scribes change it. You know... When, this is how sacred, you've got to understand how s- sacred God's name is. When the scribes in the Old Testament used to write the name Yahweh, 
Do you know that they would actually go and bathe and wash to be ceremonially clean because they wouldn't even allow themselves to write his name while they were dirty? That name Yahweh is actually spelled Y-H-V-H, Yahweh, Yarovao, I think is pronounced in the Hebrew. And it actually means breath. They would only speak it, the high priest would only speak it one time a year when they went into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the people's sin. God's name was so holy and so sacred. Even when the high priest spoke it, they would then have to go and wash after that to make sure that they were clean. What's my point? The name Yahweh is the name that saves. We, we, we've been singing that his name is the highest. We've been asking as we sing that song, can these bones live again? And God's saying, if you would breathe over those bones, if you would prophesy over those bones, my breath, they will come back to life. You've got to speak the name of Jesus. Hold your hand up like this, right in front of your face, and say, prophesy. Prophesy. What did you feel? You felt the breath. You felt the wind. Until you speak, nothing changes. If you don't speak into those circumstances, they don't change. So stop cursing the circumstances because you're activating demons to come and watch over the word. But you start to speak what God says over those things and you watch it change. Watch the bones come together into a mighty army. You know, this is how you pronounce Yahweh. Ready? Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh means breath. You know, Kong here, a pastor from Singapore, illustrated like this. He said, what's the first thing? All the parents in the house, wave your hands. Parents, wave your hands. All right, when you had your baby, Christina, when you had your baby, what did you do, Valerie? The first thing you're looking for is to see your baby do what? <gasps> Breathe. <gasps> Isn't it interesting that the first words out of a baby's mouth is Yahweh? God wanted so much to make sure that you were blessed with his name, that he made sure that <gasps> way was the first words out of your mouth. God was so intent on blessing you and allowing you to come under his name that he made sure that once you die, what's the last thing we do before we die? <gasps> way. Yahweh, his name. Watch your words. Don't desecrate the name of God. It is holy. For those who love to take notes and make it practical, as we close up, let me just give you three thoughts, um, three scriptures and three thoughts. First of all, Leviticus says this. It says, anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is going to be put to death. I'm just trying to illustrate my point. Let that scripture come up on the screen. I want to illustrate my point how sacred and how serious God is about his name. Anyone who blasphemes will be put to what? Death. In Malachi, you know, he says, I am the Lord your God. I do not change. Now, I know that scripture's Old Testament, but look at it in Proverbs. He says, this is the reason why I have to put you to death. Because life and death are in the power of your tongue. So when you see a situation and you'll just speak what you see, who knows that thing doesn't change. So I can either praise God and invite his presence, or I can either curse God and invite demons. Because when the praise goes up, God shows up. When the complaining comes out, guess who shows up? That's why God says life and death are in the power of his tongue. And so even in the New Testament, watch this, some more scripture, New Testament, Acts 7, people are trying to do things in God's name, but you can't just do it saying the name of God. You've got to live as though you're in that name. It has to match his character. It has to match his name. Watch this. It says in, in Acts that some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, trying to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. You would think that's good because they're saying Jesus, but they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. You don't need to know the name of Jesus that Terence preaches. You need to know the name of Jesus that died for you, that cleansed your sins, that forgave your mistakes, that makes you holy in the sight of God. It has to be personal. That's why the whole Ten Commandments is about a relationship. Because look what happens when they tried to use the name they weren't under. It says, the seven sons of Sceva, Jewish priest, this is the pastor's kids using the name and it didn't work for them. Because what happened to them? It says, one day, the evil spirit answered, Jesus, I know. That's how it would have sounded. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? Parents, you've got to get your children to have a relationship with God. You keep bringing them to church. You keep bringing them to youth. 
You've got to take them through destiny steps so they understand that God has a unique purpose for them. Take your kids to freedom. Next year, I'm telling you, we're going to do freedom for the young kids. We're going to do freedom for the next gen because they need to get that freedom from a young age and realize that he is not just the God of your grandparents or your parents. He's an ever-present God who is for them. And he says, Paul, I know, but who are you? And this is what happened. The man who had the evil spirit they were trying to cast out, the evil spirit jumped off that man, jumped on them, overpowered them, and gave them such a beating. I don't know in who in here has felt like you've had a beating in your life. But I want to tell you, if you have been fighting the enemy on your, on your own, his name is the highest, his name is the greatest, your name, it stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all thrones and dominions. Jesus, it stands above. You've got to start to know that name. You've got to declare that name. Your words, your walk, your worship. Jesus is the only name that heaven stands at attention to. Your name is the only name that angels watch over those words. Your name is the, Jesus' name is the only name that makes demons tremble. Where the name of Jesus, sickness has to leave. At the name of Jesus, light comes into the dark situations of your life. If you need the depression to go, you got to sing your name. He's the highest, your name. He's the greatest, your name. You with me? It stands above them all, all thrones, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. Your name canceling cancer today. Your name, your name is bringing the healing. Your, your name, name is the greatest. Your name. Jesus, you open doors with your name. All oh. thrones and dominions, oh. all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. Listen, the musicians were right. I'm not finished yet. Sit down, give me five minutes. Just make some room on the Red Sea. Now, I've got to give you this because when you misuse God's name, you're going to miss the power. Don't use God's name out of character. Let me give you a few things. Don't use God's name to inflict harm and don't use God's name to imprison people. You know, I really fear for those people who in the witch hunt and the witch burnings for 18th century and the 1800s, the Roman church, they robbed, they raped and they pillaged the Jewish people in the name of God. God's not going to stand for that. Radical Islamists use the name of God to fly planes into buildings, to rape and to hurt people. God doesn't stand for that. That's not his name. Don't use it for slavery. For years, the name of God was used to enslave black people and make them feel inferior. I worry for those people who have used God's name for that. They better get Jesus because they're in trouble if they don't. The Ku Klux Klan use God's name in vain the way it should not be used. I worry for them. Can I tell you, be very careful when you tag the name of God onto your ideas. Listen, I know God speaks and He speaks to me, He speaks through me. But be very careful when you say, God said, if God didn't say. God told me to leave my job. Did He? God told me to leave my husband. Did He? You've got to be very careful. Tag. You know, Pastor Emma felt that God told her that I was the one she was supposed to marry. But she didn't tell me until after we married, after we were married. Be very careful using God's name to manipulate people to get your own way. God will not stand for it. I'm telling you this as your pastor because I believe many of us are suffering because we are misusing the name of God. There's a lot of people who use these 10 commandments to enslave people. This is not to get you into heaven. Only Jesus can get you into heaven. 
And once you start putting rules and regulation of our pathway into heaven, Paul says it's a doctrine of demons. There is only one name on the heaven and on earth that you can be saved and it's the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This may cause me to be blessed, but only Jesus is the name that saves me. Einstein, his name might open the door to science. Rockefeller might open the door to riches, but there is only one name, Samantha, that closes the door to hell and the grave. And there is only one name that opens heaven's gates so your name can be written in the book of life. His name is Jesus. His name is all powerful. His name is mighty. Because your name, not yet. <laughs> Three ways. Number one, respect. You gotta keep his you gotta keep his name holy. Number one, you gotta respect his name. Respect his name. Put some respect on my name. He's not the big man upstairs. He's not your homeboy Jesus. Put some respect on his name. Now I know we want to get cute with it, but do you know that name is holy? Should be street, treated with reverence and respect. Write this down. Don't let your relationship with God cheapen your reverence for God. I believe that some of us have gotten so familiar that we've lost the respect for his name. Number two, not just respect his name, but represent his name, represent his name in your walk in life, not just your words, but in your walk. Here it is. Sometimes respect his name with your walk. Do you know the only reason why most people haven't become Christians is because they haven't met a Christian. Do you also know the only reason some people haven't become Christians is because they have met a Christian? Do you know sometimes the only Bible people will read is your life? Come on, will you represent God in His truth? Will you represent Him with forgiveness? Will you represent Him to silence the gossip? Will you represent the name of Jesus in your workplace? Don't match their energy. Don't to be the thermostat. Be, be, don't be the thermometer. Be the thermostat that turns the temperature up with love and forgiveness and grace. Number one, respect His name. Number two, represent His name. And three, finally, you've got to reverence His name. Rev reverence his name. You know the word reverence means to, it's like from the root word reserve. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've walked on the plane and I've reserved 12A. And then I see some dude sitting in 12A. Or you go to the movies and you've chosen that seat, but some kid has left the other cinema and come to your cinema trying to get a free movie. You know who you are. And they're sitting in your seat. How does it make, how does it make you feel when someone's taking what's yours? God feels the same way. He has reserved a seat for you in heaven where there's riches, where there's abundance, where there's forgiveness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You're looking for peace. And peace is not the possession of something. Peace is not even the absence of problems. Peace is the fruit of something, the presence of God. You can't have the peace of God until you have peace with God. Some of you here today, you've never made peace with God before you can declare the names which we're going to do in such a moment because some of you have had an inferior name and demonic name over your life. There's been generational curses that can't be broken because your family line carries that name. Today, we're going to snap it. We're going to break it as we declare the name of Jesus. But first, you've got to understand that His name is something that you need to be under, not just the blood that covers you but the living waters that cleanse you. Yeah. If you're here today, you've never made peace with God with every eye closed and every head bowed. I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation. If you need salvation here today and you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess His name with your mouth, you shall be saved. So I'm going to pray a prayer. If you want me to include you in that prayer, lift your hands up right now. Just lift them up so I can see. If you need that prayer of salvation, I'm not even going to count. So many hands going up. 10, yeah. 15, 20, about 30 hands going up in this room. Right now, God sees those hands. That's what you need to know. Keep them up for a second because your father sees them. And with a new name, there's going to be a new narrative, a new story. So let's pray this prayer together. Say, dear God. Dear God. Come on, every voice. Dear God. Dear God. Thank, you for thank you for sending Jesus to find me, to find me. And, forgive me. and forgive me. Thank you for covering me with your blood. 
and thank you for cleansing me with your living water. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new, whole, and complete. Today, I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. 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 We are celebrating with you and we want to walk this journey together. And if you prayed that prayer or you want to know more about Jesus, follow the prompts that are on the screen right now. Our vision is God's vision for you and that's to see you live a better story, holy, healthy, happy and bringing heaven to earth. And if you've been impacted by what you hear, partner with us. Yeah, together we can make both an epic and an eternal difference. The giving options are coming up on the screen to share the love and see people meet Jesus and live that better story. Hey, and if you're in the South Florida area, we would love to see you in person. Check out the description below for times and places where we can meet and we'd love to see you soon. Yes, where friends become family at History Makers Church.